All right, welcome back. I'm sorry I've been away for a little bit. I've had a lot of stuff going on uh, with moving the arcade and getting business stuff ready and working on other things and general uh, life has gotten in the way. So it's been a while since I've been able to upload a video and I apologize. But uh, so locally, I have a friend who also collects and fixes up games and he had a, uh, I believe a cocktail machine that came through his possession that had a Geo 7 here that was totally dead. And he said that the it doesn't do anything. It's dead, and the the fuse down here is blown. F901, I believe that is. Uh, and he said it just was nothing was happening. It was made no noise, no no activity, no signs of life. It was dead. And he gave me gave me a cap kit to put in there, and I've got a new flyback and a new uh, horizontal width coil because this one is functioning, but of course it's broken like all of them are from the heat. Uh, so we'll go through and see if we can get this one figured out. I got my bag of GL7 parts with fuses and, and uh, transistors and pots and stuff. So got that at the ready if we need it. But the cap kit has already pretty much been done. It looks like somebody has already accomplished the cap kit. All these Nichicon caps are, uh, I don't, I don't want to say brand new, but they've all, all been replaced. Now, you know, of course, as I say that, uh, these two caps here are original, but... You know, these have been replaced, and that's been replaced, and this one, and that one, and these here, and the ones underneath the shield here have been changed out. So it's at least had a most, mostly, mostly complete cap kit. Uh, filter cap's original, but I don't normally change the filter cap unless it actually has signs of failing and needs replaced. There's not really any reason to replace the filter cap unless it's going bad. Uh, but I guess we can dive into this. Uh, it's reported as being dead and the fuse here is blown So let's see if we can verify that if we can figure out what's going on and uh, Kind of go from there So we'll set everything aside for the moment here since we don't need it and let's get uh, some testing done our Adjustment arm here is loose so we can tighten that up. I guess it doesn't really matter because uh, We're gonna be turning it over back back and forth a number of times so it'll probably just get loose again but let's tighten it for the moment okay that's better all right so these can hold a bit of a charge so let's see if we can zap it in case it's whoa holy crap <laughs> whoa holy crap <laughs> whoa <laughs> I'm glad I did that. <laughs> Holy crap. Yeah, that filter cap had all of the, the, the sauce. <laughs> Holy cow. Oh, that, that's why uh, it's always <laughs> the, the Geo 7, even when you discharge it, even when you stick your uh, screwdriver underneath the anode cap and you got your alligator clip that you clip to the frame, even if you discharge it, you're only discharging the picture tube. Discharging the the monitor by doing this method only discharges the tube. It does not discharge the chassis. And the Geo 7 is unbelievable, unbelievably notorious for, even though you've discharged the tube, it, it's notorious for zapping people. And that, my friends, right there is why you want to discharge the filter cap on the Geo 7 before handling it because, oh my God, that... I'm glad I did that because that would have been very detrimental to my uh, my health if I had. <laughs> Holy cow! That filter cap was 100% charged. Good lord! Look at my look at my driver here. That is. Uh... <laughs> Holy cow! Wow. So, whew. <laughs> okay, let's move on from that point. Um, all right. Now that we can handle this safely, oh geez, I didn't even get shocked and my heart's racing. That's that's the, you know, I, I've never seen one, uh, you know, I always discharge those like that. That's why I did that. But I've never seen one fully discharged. That, this, this was 100% charged up. Uh, usually it leaks out over time, but oh man, that was, that was crazy. All right, let's get to testing here. All right, so is in fact our fuse blown? Test, always test your leads first and yep gone okay so we'll test our voltage regulator that's this guy over here and the easiest way to do that is just go across the B plus resistor and see if we have a short across the resistor nope 
220 ohms is what we're supposed to read and we get 218 so voltage regulator is most likely okay so now let's test our HOT so we'll go to diode mode we'll put our negative lead in one of the screw holes and we'll touch each one of the two HOT legs here uh, we'll touch this one and the other one no nope. HOT is good it's not the HOT, it's not the uh, voltage regulator, but we can verify the regulator. We can, you know, normally if you just go across the resistor, it'll read shorted. Uh, that'll let you know, but we'll test each leg here. Yep, 5.3 and 1.8, that's good reading. So the regulator's okay, the HOT is okay. Um, I don't know why. The, the uh, fuse will be blown. Let's go to resistance mode and check this resistor down here. What well, should be 2K? And we get oh 2.1 ohms. That should be 2K. 2.2. There, well, there's our problem. That's at least one of our problems. Let's check our uh, rectifier diodes down here. And make sure none of those are shorted. That one's all right. That one's all right. That one's okay, and that one's okay. All right. Well, why did which resistor is that? That is R nine hundred two. Why did why is that reading two ohms? It should be two thousand ohms. Let's take it out real quick. And if we look here, you can see 2K should be 2,000 ohms. So is it the resistor or something else in circuit? Let's go back to ohms and let's see here. 2.2 ohms. Oh, we got a bad uh, R902. Was that 902? Yep, R902. Well, let's see if I can grab one from a donor chassis or some other source, and I'll be right back. Okay, so I've got a donor chassis here. This one was uh, going into shutdown. I spent weeks and weeks going over every single individual component. I could not find the problem, so it became a donor chassis. So, I have this one here, and we're going to test that same resistor and see what it reads in this one. And it reads 2.1. That is odd. Hmm. Why? It's stamped on there 2K. Huh, am I, am I reading that wrong? I am reading that wrong. Why am I reading that wrong? Oh, uh, that's my mistake. It's supposed to be two ohms. This is correct, two ohms. Just like if we look here, we got 220 ohms, and then it has a K at the end. I mistook that for 2K. I don't know why. I had a brain fart there for some reason. So even though this one reads two, 220 you know, K, it only reads 220. So same thing with this. This should be two ohms. Why I, uh, why I for some reason brain dumped that that doesn't mean 2K and it just means two, I don't know. Uh, that's my mistake, sorry. That's why this is the amateur channel. Let's put this back in here. And it's quite possible that we simply had a failed fuse. I mean, that does happen, but something has to be shorted that took out that fuse. And if it's not the, the rectifier diodes or the B-plus resistor or this resistor or the HOT or the voltage regulator, it quite possibly could be the flyback. Uh, a lot of times when that fuse goes, it's a sign that the flyback has failed. So it may simply be the fact that the flyback has gone bad. So if there's nothing else that we find that's wrong, uh, we'll just throw in a new flyback 
and power it up and see what happens. Because at the very least, if it goes out again, we can just replace it and we know the flyback isn't the issue. But for the basic quick testing here for that fuse blowing, we know it's not the, the HOT, it's not the, or HOT, HOT, voltage regulator, B plus resistor, rectifier diodes, uh, all that stuff is okay. R904, I guess we have, 902, I'm sorry. I work on so many chassis, I forget the numbers. So 902, uh, I brain farted that it was supposed to be 2K. Sorry, forgive me. <laughs> Please forgive me, I made a mistake there. Um, <clears throat> I'm still frazzled by that damn filter cap exploding. <laughs> All right, so there's really nothing else that would cause that to go with the exception of there is FR, what FR902, is that what that is? Uh, FR901. Uh, there is a resistor, a fusible resistor, so to speak, right here. This guy, this guy right there, that w a white thing. Let's check that, because sometimes that can go out and cause that fuse to go. But we're reading 220, so that's fine. Um, then there's another one up here. I'm trying to go off of memory. Okay, uh, let's see. That is FR401, fusible resistor 401. And it should be 68 ohms. If this one is bad, that can cause uh, that fuse to go out as well. So we'll check, it should be 68 ohms. Probably gonna have to check on the bottom side. And it's across these two pads here. And we get 68 ohms. So it's likely that our problem is just simply the flyback has failed. So let's replace the flyback and then uh, kind of go from there. It's already been capped. There's these two caps here that weren't changed and it's probably because they're bipolar. So uh, we can grab the cap kit and change these bipolar caps, but I'm not gonna worry about it at this moment. Since everything else tests okay, I'm not gonna worry about changing the horizontal width coil just now. I just wanna get the power up. So let's remove the fuse, remove the flyback, change those two components and then turn it on and see what happens because uh, that's all I'm kind of interested in. We can clean it up and, and uh, do some reflow and stuff afterward. Uh, B plus here. Let's take this potting compound off of here and wipe it back and forth. It's been sitting in one place for 40 years and put it back roughly where it should be. All right, then we'll worry about if it powers up and works, then we'll worry about testing it and uh, adjusting it later. But it's right now it's back where it was within close enough to not cause a problem. Uh, all right, so let's get this fuse out of here and turn my desoldering station on. And while we're waiting for that, I can get this fuse out of here. And get a new one installed. Wait a minute. That's not the right thing. I took out the FR901. <laughs> I'm on a roll today. Shut up, you! Alright, let's get that FR901 back in there. So now let's get this fuse out of here. Easier said than done, because it wants to be stubborn. And I, man, I took out the, I desoldered the leg of R903. Man, I am not doing very well today. Three's back in. Okay, man, I just, I am on a roll. That uh, filter cap explosion kind of 
baffled my uh, my brain there for some reason. All right, so let's test this again on a circuit just for shits and grins, and we are on continuity mode, and if we touch the fuse, it is indeed open. All right, so we'll set that aside, and let's grab another fuse. All right, adjustment pot kit that I don't need to install unless we need to. B-plus pots, uh, thermistors, uh, vertical ICs. All right. Here we go. Now, if I recall correctly, that is a uh, 1.25 amp, and that's what I have right here. 1.25 amp, and they've got the legs on them already that are specifically for the GO7. So let's grab one of these guys. Oh, no, I lied. Again, these don't have the legs on them. I've got one that already has legs on it that I did previously. All right, and let's go ahead and check this other fuse just to make sure it's good. And again, we're on continuity mode. We touch this one. Yeah, that one's fine. Come on. The surface is crusty, but it's working. Okay, so here is one that I've already put the legs on, and as you can, well, as you can't see, as you can see, I got the, some component legs soldered to the side. So now, when you do this, uh, it's not as straightforward as you would imagine. It's not as straightforward as you would imagine because there is a coating on the ends of the fuse and you can't just solder to you'll you'll hold the iron on there <clears throat> and it'll never stick never work and you'll damage the filament inside what you have to do is take your fiberglass pin here your scratch pin and scratch off the coating off the end cap of the fuse scratch it off to where it's not shiny anymore and then use some flux and flux some solder onto the end cap there that you've scraped away and it'll just suck right to the, the end cap and the solder will stick nice and easy. Then you solder your leg on there and that's how you do that. So you scratch away that shiny surface coating uh, and then put, use some flux with some solder and it sticks right to it like, uh, like it should be from the factory, like perfectly, I'll just say that. So I have a fuse here that I've put some legs on already through the method I just mentioned. So if we get this in here, it may be tricky because I don't know if the spacing is correct and it's not, but if we do something like this to line the legs up, that should make it a bit easier. And if this blows again, we'll get to see the method I just described because I'll have to do it over again. Bend the legs a bit, and okay, that should stay right there. Okay, let's get that soldered in. Let's trim this a bit. All right, now let's get uh, our flyback replaced here. Okay. To give our desoldering station here a bit of a help, we're going to liquefy the joint, and then we'll bring in the the sucker here. Because sometimes these pads have a larger surface area and it's hard for the, the small surface area of the 
the gun here to liquefy it properly, so I use the iron to heat it up. And it just works out so much better. It's quicker and easier and better. Okay, ground plane, heat up there. All right, that should uh, that should come right out. Hopefully, now let's clean out. Can I do this? Yeah. Let's clean out our uh, gun here. I like to leave. I like to leave the uh, cleaner in there so we don't get any possible uh, globs that clog it up. All right, so now that should just pop right out of there. As soon as we uh, pull this back. And oh, while wow, you're having a hard time, there you go. Uh, is this wrapped around? It probably is. Yeah, sons of bitches. There we go. All right, don't forget to pull the boot off. And uh, we need to unscrew it from the side here. I do like that the manufacturer screwed this in place. It prevents the joints from cracking. You know, like the, the K7000 has the same type of thing where it's screwed in place, but a lot of other manufacturers don't secure the, the flyback properly and from vibration the joints will crack. So I do have, have to hand it to, to uh, Electrohome here to, for doing it that way. But. All right, this should just come right out now. Look at that. Easy peasy. Oh, and... <laughs> oh. <laughs> I am on a roll today. I did the wrong one. Again. I'm telling you. This is just a, a banner day. All right. Now the thing is free here. So there we go. Old flyback out. Let us put this back on. I just forgot which one went where. Uh, I think this one went over here, yeah. Okay, that is back on. Put this back like that. Okay. Okay, let's clean this up a bit since we have it out. Oh. Do we have... Look at that. There appears to be some type of leakage here. If we look under the flyback, there's some type of leakage of something right there. Now... That is a sign that our flyback is most likely the cause of our blown fuse. Most of the time when this fuse goes, if it's not a voltage regulator, HOT, rectifier diodes, uh, this fusible resistor here, or this fusible resistor here, then it's usually the flyback. So we have evidence here of it leaking something out of it. So that very well could be our problem. If we look at the bottom side here, uh, let's see that set this way. So roughly around here, uh, yeah, I can't tell from looking at it, but yeah, well, we'll put a new one in and I'll bet you it'll spring to life. Now, <laughs> given, or given everything that's happened so far, all the mistakes I've made, the, the amateur mistakes, uh, it's not looking likely, but uh, hopefully it will. You never can tell. So before we get that installed, let's just look at the back side here. Let's just give it a good cursory look. This is super clean. Whoever did the cap kit did a pretty good job. Uh, no broken solder on the header pins. The G07s aren't notorious for having cracked solder joints like other chassis, and this looks pretty good. Yeah, okay, let's get that new flyback in there, and let's just turn it on and see if it works. If it does, we can proceed forward with adjusting B-plus and changing out some of the caps that weren't replaced and uh, giving it a good solid reflow, getting our new uh, horizontal width coil installed and all that. So 
got a brand new fly back here and let's get it lined up and it should drop right in like so like so now you want to be careful trying to install these because you can cause cracks by trying to force it down in there and pushing too hard so you want to be careful and not damage the chassis you're trying to work on well, I just want to know why you're giving me such a fuss here None of the pins are bent. Why are you like this? This doesn't want to go in there. And I don't understand why. So why, it looks like pin number five needs to be bent out a bit, but it was, Ugh. there we go, got it. Man, that was the hardest one I've had to put in in a long time. Okay, so let's solder this guy back in. Well, I guess, not back in, but in. I'm gonna use the fume extractor here because my fan's in the other room. Okay, that should be all of them, and we'll take a look, and yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten. I say that that's pretty good. All right, so flyback is successfully installed. Uh, you don't have to put the screws back in, but you can if you want, and in hindsight, I probably should have done that before I soldered it in place, but it'll be okay. Oops, sorry, I gotta zoom back out here. There we go. All right. Because if everything is aligned properly, they should go right in, so no big deal. All right. And 
let's get our focus wire reinstalled. And that should be it. Okay, well, any bets? If you got bets, place them right now because I'm gonna say it's probably gonna work. So let's go get a picture tube and get it hooked up and turn it on and see what happens. Okay, and as you can see, we have it on the tube ready to go. I've got uh, anode, neck, yoke, ground, and there's no remote, and I have no video. Uh, because I'm only interested to see if it turns on, not worried about what the image looks like, just make sure it turns on and operates and the fuse doesn't blow and uh, power. So there's the 7. Uh, of course the yoke hooks up right here. Uh, ground hooks up to the neck board like always. Everything's hooked up ready to go. So let's just cross our fingers and hope that it turns on, doesn't blow the fuse. If it does and operates for a few moments then we'll go ahead and turn it off and do all the rework and reflow, cap change. Uh, and everything else it needs and then we'll worry about giving it a video signal and testing it and adjusting it after that So let's just see if it powers on and hope for the best here. Let's keep an eye on the fuse Right right there. Okay, here we go. One two three Well hot damn powered right on My hypothesis of the flyback being the cause was correct. Okay uh, We currently don't have an image. Let's turn up our screen pot here. There we go! Raster lines! Scrolling, but they're there. We have a working chassis now. Okay, well, so far anyway. Uh, Alright, that's uh... That was it. Bad flyback. So, let's get it back off the tube, get a full um, rebuild and repair and everything and testing and we'll go from there. And I realize as I say that I probably let's document how I discharge these tubes. Let me uh, The Geo 7 is not an auto discharging chassis like the all the Wells Gardner models When you turn off the chassis you hear it crackle down when it crackles down. It's an auto discharging uh, And you really don't really have to discharge it manually, but it's always a good idea to do so disclaimer disclaimer uh, but the Geo 7, as we saw from the explosion on the, the uh, filter cap, it does not auto discharge. Uh, so you will have to manually discharge the Geo 7 every time. So let's see if I can do this with one hand on the camera here. So let's clip our alligator clip onto the screwdriver and then we'll clip our other lead onto the frame here, like so. And then we'll take our lead and underneath the anode cap you'll hear a nice pop let's see if we can hear it let's listen there you go pop snap crackle and pop now it's discharged now we can take the anode cap off just like so uh, you can wiggle it back and forth to get the you know some people lift it up and use a screwdriver and, and pop one one leg out at a time but you can just kind of squeeze it and move it back and forth it comes right out now that it's out we want to try it we don't do it again here so uh, about to fall off oh, dang it uh, well we don't need the screwdriver anymore we can just tap so we have our lead here still attached to the frame let's make sure it's there's no residual uh, a little bit a little bit of residual here a little tick so now it is fully discharged however the chassis is not discharged only the picture tube that only discharges the picture tube the filter cap is likely still charged so we will have to discharge that filter cap so i'm gonna have to use two hands here to get this off so i'm gonna cut away and get this off and come back uh, I will discharge the filter cap again it shouldn't be as, as big of an explosion as last time but we'll see maybe it will uh, and then we'll do the rework that we need to do and go from there so here we go okay so we're off the tube and uh, let's see if that filter cap is still charged like it was last time now I have a suspicion the reason it was so energetic is because the flyback was was failed and for somehow some reason it allowed the filter cap to stay energized because the filter the you know the flyback never energized taking the power from the filter i'm not really sure 100 percent but i think that it was so energetic because the flyback was bad uh so we can try it again here and see what happens <laughs> should i get my safety glasses <laughs> all right let's try it again one two three oh i have to i have to here we go one two 
three. Ah, uh, see there? Nothing. This time, we had nothing. So, the filter cap was able to properly discharge upon turning off the chassis because the flyback de-energized. I think the reason this thing exploded the last time was because the flyback was bad and never energized and all the, the stored energy in, or electricity or voltage inside the filter cap wasn't able to dissipate into the flyback. So, I, yeah, because right now there's nothing. So that was the reason that happened. <laughs> Man. I'm glad I was able to actually film that because that was kind of a rare occurrence. Um, all right, so now we can safely handle it, uh, but I think we're ready to get going here. What do I want to do first? Let's do the width cap first. Okay, now this is going to be difficult because the whole thing is just stretched out, stretched out. <laughs> Okay, now I want to, I'm going to have to use, well, I don't have to use braid, but I'm not going to be able to use the desoldering iron here directly. I'm going to have to use uh, the iron and suck up what I can here. And we'll have to use the braid on the rest of it. which is sufficient. Okay, I think that'll be all right. Let's clean this out. I always clean it out and leave the cleaner inside of it to prevent it from getting gummed up. It's a general, general good practice there if you have one of these things. Now for what remains, we can just use the braid Because these can be tricky to get out. And that should be it. Let's see if it Come on. There you go. Ow. And there's our width coil. <laughs> I am going to steal this. I'm going to steal this ferrite core for later use if need be because it doesn't do any good for this. This is going to go in the garbage and our original flyback is going to go in the garbage. And let's get our new one installed. And someone's bent this all up. Doesn't matter which way it goes in. Uh, you just want to make sure that you've got your... See, these two are part of the coil here. These two do nothing. These are just um, support feet to keep it flat on the board. So it, do, it, it does matter which way it goes in, I should say. It doesn't... It, uh, how do I phrase this? The... If we look at the back side of the board here, uh, the coil is identified by right there. So it has to go in where the coil is like, has to go in like this. So the coil marks have to go this way. So it does matter which way it goes in. Uh, what I meant to say was is that uh, you can't put it in backwards. That's what, I, that's what I meant to say. You can't put it in backwards because the size of the tabs are different compared to the footprint. So you really can't put it in backwards, uh, but you want the coil the two legs there to go match up with what the screen print on the board is. So in that case, that's going to be this way. Like so. There we go. Make sure it's sitting on there flat. Show enough. And we are good. All right, so let's get this soldered in here. 
let's grab the fume extractor again. I want chicken, I want liver, meow mix, meow mix, please deliver. So those are thick pads, so you want to leave the iron on there for a little bit to allow it to flow properly. So that's pretty good. Better than factory, as Alex would say, from Northridge Fix. And that's good. So let's see if we can get these two caps replaced. These are 50-volt uh, 3.3 bipolar caps. Before I take them out, let me dig through my stash and see if I can find some. Zoom out a bit. And do I have a derelict, do I have a derelict, uh, Geo 7, I do have a couple of derelict Geo 7, like this one here. I've got a whole, I have, uh, let's see here, let's zoom out, I have one, two, three, four, Four, five, six, seven, eight, eight Geo 7 cap kits uh, on hand here. And then I have this one here that's kind of been picked from various things. And uh, let me go through here and see if I actually have those caps on hand. So let's see what we can figure out here. Right. 3.3 bipolar caps. Do I have any in here? There's one. Bada bing. Do I have the other? Ha <laughs> ha. There we go. 3.3, 50 by. All right. So we'll steal those. This is already an incomplete kit because I've stolen some stuff from the other, uh, from this before. But I hold on to the rest of these just for an instance like this. So, and plus I got what nine other ones here. So, we'll fold this back up and stick this back in here. Okay, that, that worked out. Let's get these replaced. That's odd. There's, there's fresh solder. There's fresh solder on the joints like they were replaced, but they're absolutely the original ones. Somebody probably just reflowed them. Ooh man, yeah, look at that. Look at look at that. That's that is not good. Alright. Let's grab the other one here. Oh, there's the other one. I don't know if you can see that. That's not good. All right, well, let's get the replacements in there. Bipolar, polarity doesn't matter. They do have it marked, but... So I always find it entertaining when I'm watching people do solder work uh, because if, to me, I've been through solder tech school and I spent many years in the military doing stuff like this. And it's interesting to me when I watch people solder like on YouTube that, that really just kind of pick it up on their own is they don't really do it properly. Like with the, the, the microsecond that the solder starts flowing, they take the heat off. Like they'll, they'll go like this and that's all they do. 
you know, the instant the solder starts to flow, they take it off. Now you don't want to do that. You want to make, you want to leave it on there for a few seconds to make sure it flows into everywhere it needs to flow to, and it gets good heat transfer, and you get a good joint. You end up with uh, cold solder joints when you start when you remove the the iron, the microsecond it starts to flow. I just I don't understand that. But you know, if that's what they do and it works for them, go for it. All right, so this has actually had the curl, the the curl mod has been done. So there's normally a uh, a film cap right here in this location. There's a film cap. Uh, there's another film cap. Uh, actually, no, they did not do the. Wait a minute. No, I take that back. I think, I think the the cap that was in this location gets moved to down here, and then you you put this one in its place. Let me read up on that because I thought the curl mod was done, but I could be wrong here. If it's not done, we're going to do it. Okay. Okay. If we read here, this says... The last step is to install the sink modification upgrade which prevents horizontal curl caused by mismatched negative sink output of certain games on the Geo 7. Uh, remove C501 and throw it away. Well, I can tell you that that was not done. So the curl mod has not been done. This is C501 right here. So let's take that and throw it away. But we're not going to do that just yet. We'll place it off to the side. So C501 is out. Remove C501. Remove existing capacitor C303 and install in it position C501 and solder in. So that's not good because somebody has removed C503 already. Wait a minute. No, that's 303. Oh, yeah, C303. I'm sorry, I read 503. Remove existing capacitor C303, install it in C501. Well, someone uh, someone didn't, they took out C503, but instead of putting it in C, no? Okay, maybe they did. I see. So yeah, the curl mod was done. All right. Man, I am batting a thousand on this thing. I am not looking good this time, boys and girls. <laughs> I'm not looking good on this repair, I'll tell you that. Making a fool of myself. So, obviously, this capacitor that was in C501 used to be up here, and they did do the curl mod. It was done. For some reason, it's been so long since I worked on the Geo 7 that I thought that there wasn't supposed to be a cap here, and that's what threw me off. All right, well, I guess it was done. So, disregard. <laughs> Batting a thousand today on this thing. I've never made so many mistakes at one time, uh, but I don't mind, uh, I don't mind looking bad on camera. We're not all perfect. I think somebody washed this. Someone washed this and uh, didn't dry it. They just let it sit there and let all the water uh, evaporate, and that's how you get all this white residue on here and that's how the paint flakes off the paint flakes off this thing when people wash them but uh, okay so our cap kit is is complete the curl mod was done new uh, horizontal width coil new flyback everything's operational so now let's uh, hook it back up give it a video signal Make some adjustments, check and adjust our B+, plus. and if we can get everything operational and working and looking good, we'll call it done. There's not much else that needs to be accomplished. 
Uh, I need to go through and do a complete reflow as well, but I can do that later. No reason to bore everybody with that. So I may actually just do the full reflow now. There's no reason to hook it up, take it back off, and hook it back up again. So I'll do the full complete reflow now of anything and everything that possibly needs it, and then I'll get it hooked up and we'll test. So when I come back, I'll have all that done. We'll have it back on the chassis, or I'm sorry, back on the tube, have the chassis on the tube, and we'll do some final testing adjustments, B plus, everything, and make sure it's all good, and we'll call it done. Okay, so I got the full reflow done, and I was going to hook it back up to the tube, but I, I need to point something out in reference to how the video hooks up on the Geo 7. The Geo 7 is kind of a unique animal in the fact that you have to provide the sync signal, the composite sync signal, to both pins 2 and 3 of the 3-pin connector. So like most of, of these chassis of this era, there are six video pins and three sync pins. Now basically you have red, green, blue, ground, uh, pin 5, I believe, is positive sync. Pin 6 is negative sync. And then for the 3-pin connector, you have ground again. Pin 1 is ground, 2 is positive sync, and 3 is negative sync. So you have there's no composite sync signal on the G07. Like a standard Wells Gardener, pin 10 will be the composite sync. Uh, but unlike the G07, um, there is no composite sync pin. So... On the Wells Gardener, you can do, you know, one, two, three, four, red, green, blue, ground, and then five, six, or nothing. There's nothing in pin seven, and then it goes uh, eight, nine, ten for the three pin connector like this one. So, if in instance, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, there's no seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, it won't work this way. On, on the Geo 7, pin 10 is not composite sync. There is no composite sync. So, you have to actually add a jumper from the negative sync to the positive sync to combine them into, into composite sync or to composite them together. So, for instance, in order to get a correct sync signal in Geo 7, you need to add... This is if you're using JAMA. If you're using an old ages game like Pac-Man, uh, Galaga, and it has Geo 7 in it from the factory, it'll have two separate sync signals. So that won't need... This won't need to be done on something like that. But if you're using a JAMA game that uses composite sync, you're going to have to add a pin. Can I do this here? Let's take this out. You have to add a pin to pin 9, plug it in, and then jumper it over to pin 10. You have to imagine, I don't want to do this permanently, but there you go. So you have to combine pins 9 and 10. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for the main one. Red, green, blue, ground. Pin 1 is an another redundant ground connected to pin 4. So pin 1 of the 3 pin and pin 4 of the 6 pin are both the same ground. Uh, so red, green, blue, ground, 5 and 6 are nothing, uh, 8 is another redundant ground, and then 9 and 10 are negative and positive. I could have those backwards, it doesn't matter, uh, but you have to combine the two sinks together to get a composite sink signal. So you have to hook it up this way using a JAMA connection for a JAMA game or a uh, test pattern generator to get a, a proper sink signal. So I wanted to point that out uh, for confusion of how Geo7s operate based off of a normal regular composite sink chassis. So now that I've got that out of the way, let's hook it back up and see what we can make this, or how well we can make this look. Okay, all hooked back up, ready for testing. I have the video hooked up, just like we just explained. I've got the red lead here, the meter, going to... Oh, let's turn it on. Volts DC. All right. So we're hooked up to read B+. We got negative on the frame, positive on this point here of the B plus resistor on the regulated side. So we're hooked up to read B+, everything's connected and ready to go. Video, let's turn our test pattern generator on. And B+, on the GL7 should be 120 volts DC. So we're hoping to be somewhere near there after wiping that pot back and forth and just setting it uh, randomly based off where it normally should be. Uh, otherwise, yeah, let's uh, turn it on and hope for 120 and hope it works. See what kind of image we get. Here we go. One, two, three. Wow, 120.7, 20.6, perfect. Mm, nothing yet, but it's an old, there we go, old tire tube, you got it. Wow, awesome, okay, uh, 120.4, couldn't ask for anything better than that. It's even settling down to closer to 120. So yeah, I think all that was wrong with this was a flyback. Um, a little reflow and a couple of new caps and new fuse. Good cleanup, and uh, it should be good to go. 120.2, all right. So let's uh, 
see if we can make this look better. I hate this stupid tripod. There we go. Oh, gosh, I hate this stupid tripod. All right, we're a bit out of focus. Uh, so let's adjust that. Oh, crystal clear. We got some convergence issues. How do we have convergence issues? Shouldn't have been convergence issues. That's a bit better, okay. We need to shift the image to the right. So we need to move the horizontal shift uh, H center tab to the other one. What? Uh, that's as far as that goes. Well, we might have to do the horizontal centering uh, mod, but vertical seems okay. Let's adjust our vertical size. Um, vertical height. Mm, that's not bad. Vertical linearity needs a tweak. That's better. Um, horizontal frequency. Yeah. That seems to be where it likes to be set there. Uh, that's about all we get. So it's sh it shifted too far to the left. And making an adjustment on the horizontal centering pins. Um, don't seem to help me. That's as far to the right as I can shift it. Normally you can adjust the H hold and it'll shift it over, but for some reason it won't let me do it this time. Um, yeah, probably have to do the, verti the horizontal centering mod on this. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, and look at this. Look at that. 120.0 without adjusting a thing. I, I just ballparked that after wiping it back and forth, ballparked it back in the spot, and look at that. That's absolutely awesome. Uh, well, uh, let's adjust our horizontal size. Make sure that works. Of course, I'm using a plastic adjustment tool here. I don't know, it's going to be hard to see. A little plastic adjustment tool in the H, uh, H coil. And we will turn it until... Okay, it works, but we're shifted too far to the right. And let me... Hit the button here. Yeah, it's way too far. I'm sorry, we're shifted to the left. We're way too far left. Look at that. There's an inch and a half gap over here. Uh, otherwise, that is beautiful. Look at that. That is amazing. But we have to figure out how to show. Let's see, there's. Um, I'm. Let's see. I don't think I have any horizontal centering kits. I do not. I don't have any horizontal, so we're not going to be able to do that. I do have videos. Uh, you can get a horizontal centering kit from Arcade Parts and Repair that uh, removes the jumpers and installs a pot, and you can use a pot to shift it left and right. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do that on this video because I don't have any of those kits. Uh, so I, I want to, let's hook up an actual PCB. Let's use the Mortal Kombat PCB and hook that up and see if it's just a test pattern generator thing or if we need to shift it over on an actual game. Um, but I'm not going to be able to adjust it to the right any more than it already is. But that, with not, that notwithstanding, we've got a really good picture. So I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth here. Absolutely awesome. Uh, vertical holds a bit off when you go to the white screen, but that's all right. Yeah, we need to shift. And I got real bad conversion on this tube. Wow. I don't know if you can see that. It probably doesn't pick it up in the camera. But there you go. Let's see if we can fix that real quick. Well, that's a bit better, but... Now the opposite side is 
off. Well, that's about as good as I'm going to be able to probably get it. Hmm. Yeah, close enough. Okay. Well, better than it was. Okay. All right, well, let's hook up an actual PCB here. I wonder if I can... I'm going to have to do some jury rigging here with that extra sink wire, so hang on a second. Okay, got the jury rigging done. Got the JAMA connector hooked up from the JAMA harness. We got the MK1 board, so let's see if we can make it look a bit better with an actual PCB. Because uh, as good as the test pattern generator is, it's always a good idea to use an actual PCB to get a, an idea of what that would look like. Okay, just like the test pattern generator on the white screen, we knew we had a vertical hold issue. So if we adjust vertical hold a bit, there we go, locked on, and it's not shifted to the left too far at all with the real PCB. That's why it's important to use a real PCB because we have the, about the same uh, gap on left and right. But the game isn't uh, running yet, so we got to make sure the game is actually running. Let's fix our linearity. That's better. Vertical shift needs to go up. And that's as high as that's going to go. And an actual PCB yeah, look at that. It's even on both sides. That's why it's important to use an actual board. And we're way too blue, but colors don't matter. Because it's not staying on this tube. We'll set everything to the center, which I forgot to do, which I normally do. Turn the brightness up, and hey, that's not bad. It's too bright, and it's too blue, but... There you go. Look at that. Now let's adjust our horizontal size again. This, uh, this coil is pretty stiff for being brand new, but I'd say that's good enough. And let's adjust vertical size just a little bit. And outstanding. Look at that, ladies and gents. You could not ask for a better turnout. The, the picture is exactly centered. Distance there, distance there, not exactly, maybe a little bit to the right that needs to go, but not enough to complain about at all. And everything fits on the screen. We are good to go. So we had uh, a bad flyback and a blown fuse, and that's about it. A couple caps need, didn't get changed the first time around, but I got to say, putting a real board on here, we don't have our image shifted too far to the left. Uh, that's why it's always important to use a real PCB when you can. The test pattern generator is great for what it is, but I always like to use real boards to get a real-life situation uh, of what this is going to end up looking like uh, other than the TPG. So, B plus is set properly. I'll let this run for a number of hours like I always do, and we will call this a success. So, sorry I messed up on so many things, but you live and learn. We're not all perfect. That's why this is the amateur channel. Uh, but yep, hopefully this helped you out uh, in the future, if you're watching this in the future, to get a good idea of the GO7 and what to do. Hopefully it helped you out. Uh, otherwise, I appreciate it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.